Hello, you're watching the interview here on France Van Cat. My guest today, Bill Browder, was once the largest investor in Russia, a Chicago-born businessman whose uncanny ability to sniff out undervalued companies on the post-Soviet landscape made his high-flying investment fund the talk of the town, not just in Moscow, but well beyond. Now, for a few glory years, he blazed a trail. He exposed corruption and scandals at some of Russia's biggest companies. He named and shamed billionaire oligarchs. And he had a powerful ally, or so he thought, a man named Vladimir Putin. All that abruptly changed on November 13, 2005. Bill Browder stopped in the VIP lounge of Moscow's international airport. He was returning from London, detained for 15 hours, expelled, then banned from Russia, deemed a national security threat. He tells the story of all of those events leading up to that, his expulsion, and what's happened since in his new book. It's out in both English and, more recently, in French. English first, Red Notice. It's a story of high intrigue, how he became Putin's number one enemy, and also how his tax lawyer was murdered. And it's also out in French with the title Notice Rouge, more recently, so you can read it here in France as well. Welcome to our studios. Thank you. Bill, you've been uh, to hell and back, to say the least. Uh, ten years later, you're still uh, banned from Russia, although they'd love to have you back uh, and, and, and put you on trial. Uh, you were convicted of tax evasion in a Russian court. Uh, no one recognizes that outside of Russia. I want to start with Boris Nemtsov, though. The world is, a lot of the world and much of Russia is, is shocked at his, uh, what's being called, even Putin calling it a political assassination. Uh, you yourself warned at the end of your book that uh, you believe, you suppose you could be a target one day of Putin or members of his uh, regime, and uh, if someone were to find you dead, uh, you'd know uh, who to blame. Yes. What are you thinking now? Well, I, I, the, the Nemtsov assassination was an act of political terror, um, and the purpose of this wasn't just to take out the most high-profile opposition politician, but it was to send a message to everybody that the situation has escalated. Putin is terrified right now of this. There's an economic crisis which is brewing in Russia. And he was doing well when people didn't care. When, when people were doing, when, when people had good economics, when they could buy lots of stuff, when, the, when their salaries were good, uh, people didn't care about politics. But when all of a sudden the ruble's down 50%, oil prices are down 50%, and things are getting, people losing their jobs, um, people are now starting to say, why is the government not taking care of me? And this, was a, this is a ripe moment at which the Russian opposition could actually get people out into the streets. And Putin is scared of that. And so, um, uh, now, nobody can prove that Putin did it, but he's the most likely suspect in this murder. And, you know, what's amazing when um, you're reading your book, it reads like a political thriller. It's also a cautionary tale, I suppose, of what happens when you cross the Kremlin. But uh, he was your ally. You were um, exposing corruption, uh, the pillaging of state assets, really, at companies like Gazprom, the biggest company in the world, the state gas monopoly, uh, UES, the electricity utility, uh, Spare Bank, one of the biggest state banks in Russia. He was helping you. He was, he was sacking the oligarchs as you, were, as you were exposing them. What happened? Well, so, so when I started doing my anti-corruption campaigns in Russia, it was roughly around the time that Putin had just come to power. And there was a strange confluence of interests. And I should point out that I've never met Vladimir Putin in my life. But at the time that I was exposing these uh, oligarchs who were stealing money from, from the companies that I was investing in, um, they were stealing power from Putin, who had just become the president. And so he was saying to himself, these guys shouldn't be stealing my power. And so all of a sudden, this, this strange guy from the south side of Chicago is exposing corruption in these companies. And he would step in on a regular basis and, and, and when, after I would make a big deal about some kind of asset stripping at one of the big companies or whatever, and he would then do something. He would fire somebody, he would issue a presidential decree, et cetera. So for, for about four years, this worked perfectly. But then it all changed when he, when he won his war with the oligarchs. And he won his war with the oligarchs by arresting the richest man in the country, a guy named Michael Hordakovsky, who was the owner of Yukos Oil Company. We all remember that, yeah. He arrested him, put him in jail, allowed the television cameras to film him sitting in a cage, and if you were the 17th richest oligarch in Russia and you saw the richest guy sitting in a cage, your natural reaction was, I don't want to sit in that cage. And one, one by one by one, they went to Putin and said, what do we have to do to not sit in a cage? And, 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 and you suggest, I think you have a chapter in your book, it's called, what, the 50%? 50%. 50% meaning, meaning he got a 50% cut. Not right. the government, 
Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin, and he became the richest man in the world. Well, okay, well, let, let's, let me go with that idea for a second. The richest man in the world, richer than Bill Gates. How much is he worth? Well, this I, is all speculation. This is all right? speculation. He's, his name is not on any document because if it, if it was, then, then, then he would be dis, disqualified in a second. It's all based on what, what I call trust agreements between him and the oligarchs. And uh, I, I, my personal estimate of his net worth is about $200 billion. Now, they seized, you know, I worked in Russia in the 90s, and this was, you know, we, we knew about the mafia hits, the gangland killings, the shootings in broad daylight. The way in which they dismantled uh, your fund, Hermitage Capital Management, it was pretty violent, pretty brutal. Were you surprised? Well, what, what happened was, after I was expelled, uh, 25 police officers raided my office in Moscow, and 25 more officers raided the office of my American law firm where we kept all of our documents. They seized all the documents, and then after that, they used those documents to um, fraudulently re-register our investment companies out of our name into the name of a man convicted of murder. I hired a young lawyer named Sergei Magnitsky to intervene. Um, he figured out the whole scam, and the scam was to steal all of our money, which they didn't succeed in doing because I got it out before they raided the office. But then, this is the most cynical part, when, when, when we were getting our money out, we paid a $230 million tax bill. And the guys who stole our companies got a tax refund of 200, an illegal tax refund of $230 million. And these were, so these are government they, officials getting a tax refund from the government, not from me. Getting paid back, I, I, I understand that. You mentioned Magnitsky, and obviously that is now an internationally known name. He's become an international cause celebre, if you will. Why? Because he was found. So, so, so Sergei, Sergei Magnitsky, my lawyer, he, he, went, he went and discovered the, the scam. Yeah. He exposed the scam and he testified against the police officers. And then the police officers, in retaliation, the same guys he testified against, came to his home at eight in the morning in front of his wife and two children, arrested him, put him in pretrial detention, and then started to tor torture him to get him to withdraw his testimony. And this was a Kremlin human rights panel that actually uh, subsequently, their investigation concluded he had been beaten and tortured. It, they, they concluded that he had been beaten and tortured. The, 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 the president's own human rights panel, after, so he was beaten, tortured, killed. and killed killed on, on November 16, 2009, Sergei Magnitsky, 37 years old, wife and two children, killed. <clears throat> we began a, a, a campaign for justice, and, and uh, we thought that, 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 that this is such a high-profile case, and it was so well documented. He wrote down everything that happened to him. We figured for sure that there would be some kind of justice. And the people from top to bottom in the system, from the jail to the, uh, to the prosecutor's office, to the investigative committee, right up to the president, um, said, Nothing was wrong. But Bill, you did something that very few people uh, who've worked in Russia have done. You actually fought back against Vladimir Putin. Um, you pushed through what is now called the Magnitsky Law. It's, uh, it's uh, in the US, US Congress, right? Uh, and what is it? It's a list of Russian officials implicated in his death, banned from the United States. And there's a resolution in Europe as well. Well, banned and assets frozen. So, so, so we couldn't get justice in Russia, so we said we need to get justice outside of Russia. How do we get justice outside of Russia? The answer is these people all do these crimes for money, and they, keep their, they don't keep, feel comfortable keeping their money in Russia. They, feel, they want to keep their money outside of Russia. And so we went to the U.S. Congress and said, let's ban their, let, let's ban their visas mm. so they can't travel and freeze their assets. It became known as the Magnitsky Act. It doesn't just apply to Sergei Magnitsky. It applies to all gross human rights abusers in Russia. How many people are on the list right now? There are 34 people on the list. So far, about 30 of them are Magnitsky abusers. Four of them are from other cases. And our hope is that this becomes the, the standard, not, and not just for Russia, but for all countries. And there's, there's, a, uh, there's a global Magnitsky Act, which has been proposed in Congress as well, to go after bad guys from everywhere. Because in this day and age, you know, it, back in the Khmer Rouge days, they didn't go mm. uh, to Saint-Tropez on holiday, but they do now. You know, it, it's fascinating because you admit in your book, you say one of the things perhaps you were naive about at first in the early years is as a foreigner in Russia, you thought perhaps you were untouchable and you quickly uh, were disabused of that notion. You're out of Russia now, but I would, I would assume you, you don't feel untouchable. Well, Vladimir Putin has killed people um, in London. There's a very famous case going on right now of Alexander Litvinenko, who was murdered with radioactive pol uh, polonium. In his uh, in, tea. In, in his tea in a hotel in Mayfair. Mm. Um, and and, and th there's an inquest going on as we speak in London where it's, it's like Hansel and Gretel, the, the guys who poisoned him left a polonium trail that, that goes all the way back to the British Airway flight back to Moscow and into their seats on the plane. Um, and so we, we, know, we know that Vladimir Putin is capable of doing some very bad things um, at home and abroad. Nobody is safe. I'm not safe. Do you, do you have security? Nemtsov. You have bodyguards. You're living in London now. Well, well the one thing to, to keep yourself safe is you don't announce on France 24. <laughs> True. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs>
<laughs> we won't give your whole security detail on France 24. Um, you know, look, getting on a more serious note, though, Bill, uh, the Moscow Times reported this week uh, that Western businessmen, investors, very, very worried about more than ever about the investment climate in Russia, not just the economy. Now, you're a man who once had a lot of faith uh, in Russia's promise and potential, uh, made a lot of money in Russia as well. What do you think right now of the, uh, what would you say to investors today who are trying to be optimistic about Russia? <laughs> well, for, first of all, anybody who's still trying to be optimistic has just got a, a screw loose. I mean, it's, it's, it's absurd. I mean, you look at what's going on in Russia, they're running a, 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 an anti-West nationalist campaign the ruble has devalued by 50%. They have never diversified the economy. It's all oil. Oil prices are down 50%. They're seizing businesses left, right, and center from, from uh, using, using prison, putting people in prison to take their assets mm. away. There, there, there's absolutely a, a mountain of, of information that backs everything up, that this is just an absolutely impossible investment climate. Anyone who's still there you know, should have their head examined. And finally, we're running out of time, but very briefly, if you could give one message, one, briefly to Vladimir Putin right now, what would it be? Is that, that he, it's, it's just going to get worse for him and worse for him and worse for him as the economy gets worse. And um, just don't put your finger on that nuclear button. Bill Browder, uh, author of Red Notice in English and just out in French as well, Notice Rouge. And uh, from what I understand, it's also going to be uh, coming out in a lot of countries, uh, a book about uh, what can befall someone who crosses the Kremlin and Vladimir Putin, uh, and you just heard it, getting worse and worse. Thank you very much for uh, being our guest today and uh, sharing uh, your thoughts and uh, t talking a little bit about your book. And thanks to all of you for watching the interview here on France Cat.